A Change in Lifestyle by Jacqueline Seewald. My parents lived through the Great Depression of the 1930s, and I heard stories from both of them about how their lives changed because of it. The same was true of my in-laws, whose lives were also impact impacted negatively. For example, my husband's grandfather owned a factory. Owing to the stock market crash, he lost the factory and went back to work in the very factory he'd once owned. He could no longer afford to send my father-in-law to college. My father-in-law worked full-time as a pipe fitter and went to school part-time to earn his degree, which took seven years. My own mother graduated high school in 1929, took a job as a bookkeeper, and promptly lost it after the stock market crash. She hardly worked after that for years and lived at home with her parents. My grandfather owned a six-family house but didn't bother trying to collect rent from the tenants as no one could afford to pay. It was fortunate that he had a steady job. Somehow, my husband and I never dreamed that we'd live through anything similar. However, as they say, history often repeats itself. In 1929, the stock market crashed in the month of October. The same things happened in 2008. My husband, who believed in being fully vested in the market, was in a state of shock. Each day, the news was more dire. We've lost more than half of our assets, he told me. I just stared at him. How can that be? I thought we had good, solid investments, but it seems I was wrong. <coughs> well, we do have pensions, I said. Hopefully, they won't be affected. Since we have never lived a high lifestyle to begin with, I don't think we have to worry. I did hope to leave our children and grandchildren a generous inheritance, my husband said. He shook his head in disbelief. We'll still be able to give gifts. Love is the most important gift anyway, I said. Our children are grown and we always try to be generous to them and our grandchildren. It just won't be the same, was his reply. The world is always changing, I said. You never know what will happen. The main thing is not to get discouraged. As long as we have our health and can afford the necessities of life, there's no reason to be upset. When you have your health, you can always earn more money. I hugged my husband and he kissed me in return. I guess you're right, he agreed. We love each other. We have our health and enough money to live on comfortably. That's all that matters. We have downsized from a house to a co-op apartment. It was a major change in lifestyle, lifestyle and there are definite benefits. Unfortunately, our house was on the market at a time when the real estate market was seriously in trouble. We decided to offer our house for considerably less than it would normally be worth. Even so, our first buyer changed his mind days before clo closing. Our second buyer had trouble with the mortgage company, but finally our home was sold. As we shook hands with the new owners, I told them how fortunate they were. Not only are you getting a bargain in the price, but this house has good karma. We bought the house from a family who lived in it for nine years. They were a happy family, a husband, wife, and five children. It was a cheerful house and we had a good feeling about it. We raised our children here as well. That's good to hear, the young woman said with a smile. We have two young children ourselves and I believe in karma too. We nodded our heads in agreement, understanding each other. You'll live only six houses from the best elementary school in the township and your children won't even have to cross a street, I said. I wasn't trying to sell them the house because they'd already bought it, but I figured the real estate broker probably hadn't told them any of this. Our children used to come home each day and have lunch with me, I told them. We like the woods in the back, the young man told us. We're going to plant a large garden in the backyard. They seemed so young and happy and full of plans. My husband and I had to smile. At least some good was coming out of the economic crunch. We no longer needed a house. I was good to know that another young family would now be living in what had been a happy, loving home for us. Also, the house needed work that we no longer had the energy to perform. These may be tough times economically, but as for me, I intend to look forward, not back. As Shakespeare said in Macbeth, what's done is done and cannot be undone. I realize that it's the present and future that matter.
The title of my reading is The Unexpected Detour. On a warm June evening, my husband and I, along with our little daughter, headed down the interstate in a worn out van, pulling a pop-up trailer behind us. It had been a long day, and we were anxious to reach our vacation destination in the Great Smoky Mountains. Well, just a couple of more hours and we'd be in Chattanooga, where we planned to camp for the night and then head to Pigeon Forge the next morning. Well, suddenly my husband said, do you smell something? And he looked in the rearview mirror and, well, the tone of the question unsettled me. And I sniffed, but I didn't smell a thing. Well, he says, you know, it smells like something burning. I think we have a serious problem. At the next rest area, Stan pulled out his tools and com commenced, just like a man, diagnosing the problem. And my daughter and I, we spread a quilt under the tree where I quickly sank down in my misery. It's always something, I said under my breath. Always something happens. If only my husband had listened to me, we wouldn't be in this predicament. And when the idea of the vacation first came up, I expect deep concerns over taking such a long trip in a van with 200,000 miles under its hood. But being the eternal optimist that he was, my husband's faith proved stronger than my doubts. And now, here we sat on the side of the road, a sad little bunch. So much for optimism. Well, before long, Stan came around the corner and gave the disturbing report. There was definitely an oil leak, a bad one from all indications. But he said, if we drove slowly and stopped to add oil every few miles, we should make it to the next town. We would spend the night there and then we'd look for an auto shop in the morning. Well, I heaved a sigh of surrender, surrender as I crawled back into the van. For what seemed like hours, we crept along the freeway in silence, stopping often to add oil. My mood plummeted with every miserable mile. And as darkness gathered, we came upon this place called Nakalula Falls Park and Campground, just outside Gadsden, Alabama. Well, we went in, we registered at the office, and we set up camp and fell into bed absolutely exhausted. Well, in the morning, I rose to the wonderful smell of breakfast cooking. And peeking through the canvas flap, I saw my husband frying bacon in a skillet and four round eggs beside him. I cracked open the door an inch and said, what are you doing? And he smiled, well, I'm trying to make the best of a bad situation. Let's just eat. Well, an amazing husband, always rolling with the punches. And over breakfast, Han, uh, Stan handed me some brochures. I got these from the office, he said. It looks like a really neat place here. But I was still depressed, but I nodded, but really wasn't very interested. What I thought I would do, he said, is to take the van to the local dealership and see what the problem is. You know how that goes. I may be gone all day, but maybe we can go and do some sightseeing tomorrow. Well, I didn't say anything, but if I had, it would have been, have you lost your mind? Sightseeing? It was the last thing I was in the mood to do, but I kept quiet. And we finished eating, and I watched Mr. Optimistic drive off at a snail's pace, a trail of gray smoke following him. How could he always take such things in stride? He really expected to enjoy our visit to this unexpected town. I, on the other hand, had no such intentions. Mom, my little girl's voice came, can we go to the pool? And I said, oh, sure, sweetie, I'm right behind you. Well, I could just see the local paper's headline now. Distraught woman drowns herself in the campsite pool. Well, just about dusk, my husband drove up in a rental car. And from the way he clumped into the camper, I just knew it was bad news. And it was. After a full day of waiting for a diagnosis, another full day was needed for repairs. <coughs> Excuse me. The cost proved staggering. We discussed our payment options, but none brought relief. And later I climbed into bed, certain that this whole trip had one, been one great big mistake. 
Well, the next morning, despite my lingering gloom, we set out on a sightseeing excursion, trying not to think about why we were here. We discovered that Nokalula Falls Park and Campground, lying at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains, is both large and enchanting, a place of unspoiled natural beauty. Well, not far from our campsite, we followed a sunny path to a stone monument of Nakalulu, an Indian princess poised as if about to jump from a 90-foot cliff. <coughs> Cold water swirled around her feet and rushed over the ridge, creating a spectacular waterfall. Legend has it that Nakalulu's father promised his daughter's hand in marriage to a member of an enemy tribe in an effort to obtain peace. But the Indian maiden was in love with a man from her own tribe. Seeing no happy ending, she is said to have jumped to her death from this very cliff the day she was to be married. Well, a few feet away, we took steep steps down into the cool gorge below the falls. And as we navigated the slippery trail, I paused in a mossy clearing and looked up. Out of the frothy spray of the waterfall, giant cedars and evergreens rose up like fluted columns, and overhead, yellow sunlight winked through a canopy of leafy branches. Beautiful, isn't it? Stan said. Yes, I said, suddenly mesmerized. It is absolutely gorgeous. Well, after lunch, we hiked along a narrow trail that curved around magnificent pines, winding its way to the top of a straw-covered hill. And looking down to the valley below, I was captivated by the sight. Summer sun lay in golden ribbons along the newly mown grass. And off in the distance, a cluster of children skipped among the shadows, their laughter rising and falling. The air was alive with the smells and the sounds of summer. Breathing deeply, I sensed a lightness of heart as if this was the place that I should be. Well, as we gathered for supper that evening, we couldn't stop talking about the enjoyable day we'd spent together and the spectacular beauty that was ours for the taking. Had our trip stayed on course, we would never have seen this beautiful place. Nakalula Falls remains one of our all-time favorite places and it was there that I learned a valuable lesson. No matter where the road may take me, I won't let an unexpected detour spoil the day. Instead, I will follow its impulsive path to the sunlight and shadows just waiting to be discovered in serendipitous places. The man whispered, God, Speak to me. And a meadow lark sang, but the man didn't hear. So the man yelled, God, speak to me. And thunder rolled across the sky, but the man didn't listen. The man looked around and he said, God, let me see you. And a star shone brightly, but he didn't notice it. And the man shouted, God, show me a miracle. And a life was born. But the man was unaware. So the man cried out in despair, touch me, God, and let me know that you are here. Whereupon God reached down and touched the man. But the man brushed the butterfly away, and he walked on. May you never miss out on a blessing because it isn't packaged the way you expect. This reading is entitled, Yes, You Can. What if at age 46, you were burned beyond recognition in a terrible motorcycle accident, and then four years later were paralyzed from the waist down in an airplane crash? Then can you imagine yourself becoming a respected public speaker, a happily newlywed and a successful business person? Can you see yourself whitewater rafting, skydiving, or running for political office? W. Mitchell has done all these things and more after two horrible accidents, left his face a quilt of multicolored skin grafts, 
his hands fingerless, and his legs thin and motionless in a wheelchair. The motorcycle accident burned more than 65% of his body and left him unable to pick up a fork, dial a telephone, or go to the bathroom without help. But Mitchell never believed he was defeated. I am in charge of my own spaceship, he said. It's my up, my down. I could choose to see this situation as a setback or a starting point. Six months later, he was piloting a plane again. Mitchell bought himself a Victorian home in Colorado, some real estate, a plane, and a bar. Later, he teamed up with two friends and co-founded a wood-burning stove company that grew to be Vermont's second largest private employer. Then, four years after the motorcycle accident, the plane Mitchell was piloting crashed back onto the runway during takeoff. It crushed Mitchell's 12 thoracic vertebrae and permanently paralyzed him from the waist down. I wondered what was happening to me. What did I do to deserve this? Undaunted, Mitchell worked day and night to regain as much independence as possible. He was elected mayor of Crested Butte, Colorado to save the town from mineral mining that would ruin its beauty and environment. Mitchell later ran for Congress, turning his odd appearance into an asset with slogans such as, not just another pretty face. Despite his initial shocking looks and physical challenges, Mitchell began whitewater rafting, fell in love and married, earned a master's degree in public administration, and continued flying, environmental activism, and public speaking. Mitchell's unshakable positive mental attitude has earned him appearances on the Today Show and Good Morning America, as well as feature articles in Parade, Time, and the New York Times. Before I was paralyzed, there were 10,000 things I could do, Mitchell says. Now there are 9,000. I can either dwell on the 1,000 I lost or focus on the 9,000 I have left. I tell people that I have two big bumps in my life. If I have chosen not to use them as an excuse to quit, then maybe some of the experiences you are having, which are pulling you back, can be put into a new perspective. You can step back, take a wider view, and take a chance to say, maybe that wasn't such a big deal after all. Remember, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it. <laughs>